Divine Truth Assistance Group Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the My Will to Love presentation, Jesus discusses the three possible directions to develop your will and how two of these directions continue to be harmful. Reminds us of the specific ways to develop our will to love and challenges us to consider what is the true state of our will right now. Recorded on the 27th of February 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. You're already chatty this morning. <laughs> so have you gotten to know each other a bit? Yeah. Good day. Spent a bit of time together doing different things. Yeah, so last day. No, it's fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, six days, gone. And um, that's one of the reasons why we've got to use our will differently, because days and days turn into months, and months turn into years, and before you know it, five years' time, and everything's the same. Not much good. <laughs> Okay, well today is pretty much all about um, focusing you on reminders about how to use your will pretty much and it's also going to focus your attention on the rewards of using your will as well. So, so today what we hope to do is uh, provide you with a little bit more inspiration in terms of you know, trying to influence you <laughs> to, in, to use your will in a positive direction and particularly to use your will to love. And to, if you find that you don't have a strongly developed will to love, then, um, you know, that you want to actually start to develop that strength within you to, uh, to develop that will so that it's positively used. So that's our motivation today. And the first uh, conversation I want to have with you is on that subject, my will to love. You could say, if you, if you had any formal uh, ideas about presentation, this would be the keynote address. <laughs> not, not that it's going to appear that way, perhaps. All right, well, we've learnt a lot, haven't we, over the last you know, five days, really, in terms of uh, what we need to do with our will. The first two days, remember, we were focused, we focused our attention on analysing our will to love and change. And, and that was all about trying to see where we're really at, trying to examine where we, what, what we really feel rather than trying to convince ourselves that we don't have these feelings that we actually have. And then uh, in the next two days, the next session, we looked at our fear of using our will. And, and a lot of that revolves around fear of those four things, remember, the faith, truth, action and emotion. And those particular things have a very great, and, and your attitude to them, have a very great effect on how you're going to use your will. And then yesterday we focused our attention a bit more on what our will actually is, you know, that it comes from our soul, and also this whole concept of pain versus pleasure, and started to see the relationship, the fact that if we use our will out of harmony with love and truth, which is the same as saying if we use our will to sin, or it's the same as saying if we use our will to break God's laws, then pain will be usually the instant result, and if not instant, we'll certainly have it over a, period, a short period of time, and, and suffering will be the long-term result if we do that. But if we use our will in harmony with love and truth and in harmony with you know, God's laws and, and with the desire to not sin, then we learn that pleasure and happiness is the result. Now, the problem at this stage is that most of you don't believe that. Right. Most of you actually believe that if you use your will to feed your addictions, pleasure is the result. Right. And if, if nobody feeds your addictions, most of you believe that that's painful. So pain is the result then, if nobody feeds your addictions. And this is why, why we have to have a change in, in our internal definition of love. So that's the part of getting educated, is realising that our internal definition of love is definitely damaged 
and it needs to somehow be corrected. And as we've said all the way through this presentations, we have to go to the higher source to get it corrected. That's the only way we can get it corrected. Now, that means we have to engage our will to love. It's not just something that's going to come naturally to us because of all this, all this baggage that we've got from our you know, family of origin, from society, all these belief systems that are all out of harmony with love. Everything is based on the world's definition of love. So it's not going to be something that's just going to come to us quite naturally, particularly initially. It's going to be something we're going to have to learn how to develop this will to love and, and use our will to love quite strongly. And we're going to have to develop a strong desire to do it. It's going to have to be something that really comes from our heart in the end. All right. But there's three things with regard to using our will. There's basically three directions we can take. And that's what I would like to talk with you this morning mostly about the three particular directions that we can take in using our will. So let's look at direction number one. So direction number one is to do nothing. Now, doing nothing is very, very difficult. In other words, choosing, like doing nothing is not sinning, but also not taking any positive action. Right? That's doing nothing. It's very, very difficult to do that, actually. And in fact, the majority of you would find that it, it, some of you have tried to do nothing and yet it, it, you end up always having some kind of <laughs> response from the law of attraction that it works to try to motivate you to do something. In fact, in fact, doing nothing itself, from God's perspective, there's laws that you break when you do nothing. So, so that means that doing nothing is even a sin. <laughs> Right. So the problem, the problem with doing nothing is that it's very hard to manufacture. But if it comes to our will, if we do nothing to develop it and we do nothing to strengthen it in either direction and we do nothing to build it up and, and, and modify it so that, so that we can love more, then what's going to be the result? Well, probably isn't it exactly what we've got <laughs> or worse. Or worse, more of the same, or worse. So that's a problem, isn't it? Doing nothing is a, is definitely a problem. Now that's uh, no action. So if we look at no action, the results really are that sin remains inside of my soul. And remember, the sin itself, God's laws are trying to correct. So God's laws are working against the sin in your soul trying to expose the sin in your soul so there are going to be attraction based events that try to uh, you know get rid of this sin for you so there will still be these events occurring in your life that you attract which will be events that you believe are negative but actually are quite positive to try to trigger you to do something about the sin that remains inside of you All right renee thanks So is this mainly where reg is this mainly where regret comes from? Doing nothing over long periods of time, oh, definitely, yeah. Because what what happens is that, and in fact, I've seen people have regrets that have lasted thousands of years, like because they had an opportunity maybe a thousand years ago that they decided to not take, and then they spent their will doing a whole heap of other things during that time even if it was just self, selfish type of pursuits. And then later on, a thousand years later, they presented the same information and then they grow for that information. You know, they actually respond to it. But, but the problem is that a thousand years of their life has passed. And there's all these things that have happened to them in that time. And a, and a lot of more positive things could have happened to them in that time. And then they have the regret that they didn't choose to do it earlier. Yeah. So doing nothing, and also sinning purposely, has a lot of regret in the long run. A lot of regret. Um, is regret the same as guilt? I don't like, think so, no. Like a self-defeating... To me, regret is a real compensatory emotion. 
It's a law of compensation based emotion in the in the if we refuse to act or we act out of harmony with love and then we go, go in the future we realize we've done the wrong thing we'll also have a regret about the fact that we didn't choose to do it the last time we had this particular chance does that make sense so that's very very different than the, the other the other feelings that you might have of guilt 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 i feel is a very negative and i'm not talking here about the guilt that comes from a conscience that's been pricked by or a conscience that's been activated by the fact that you've done something wrong but i'm talking about the guilt where you go into sort of self-punishing self-attack type of guilt that type of guilt is very uh, pointless actually and not only pointless but it usually results in no action because you're not actually identifying the causal reason why you did a thing. You're just punishing yourself for doing it. That's all. Yep. So, so the, the problem with this process is, is sin remains. Highly likely I'm going to continue breaking God's laws, isn't it, while the sin remains. And in fact, the fact that the sin remains, I'm already breaking God's laws. So the, the sin remains, I'm breaking God's laws still. So I'm breaking law. And so the result is going to be, if I'm breaking law, it's just like any law, the law of gravity, you break it, you, there's a penalty or a consequence if you break it. And by the way, um, there's a whole heap of laws where there are no negative consequences at all, but because, because you don't discover those laws when you do nothing, you'll never receive the laws that will only have positive consequences. Do you follow? So there's a whole heap of laws, physical, uh, spiritual and emotional laws, that only have a positive consequence. They don't have any negative consequences at all. And if you refuse to engage those particular laws, obviously you're never going to get the benefit of only the positive consequence. Right? And then there's a whole heap of laws that do have negative consequences, uh, for our own safety actually. And uh, when we break them, obviously there's a consequence of penalty associated with that particular law. And this is one reason why we need to have a long discussion about law <laughs> and understanding laws, right? Okay, so here we go, do nothing. Well, it might sound appealing initially, you know, but in the end, no change will occur if we do nothing. But it's not a, and usually that's also not possible. Usually what happens when we do nothing, there is change that occurs and it's all negative. And that's the reality that we need to come to terms with, you know, if we don't change anything. The, the problem is inside of us there's a resistance to positive growth, to growth in love and truth. And that resistance will also, there's laws that try to access that resistance and, and let it out of you. And while you're trying to do nothing, this resistance is pr still there. So obviously there's going to be quite negative consequences even just with doing nothing. Thanks, Lani. <coughs> um, for me, it felt like um, fast track downhill. Doing nothing? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's probably more... When you try to do nothing, like I said, it's almost impossible to do nothing. So, so the majority of people who try doing nothing or not much end up really with the second choice, <laughs> usually, and that is that we do something, but it's in a very negative direction. In other words, we, we sin more. Right. So you can use your will to sin more. Now, even choosing to do nothing is creating a sin that you weren't creating before. So, so you're actually sinning more. You, you see what I'm saying? So while you might think doing nothing is an option, and many do on the planet, many do think doing nothing about their will to love is an option, and they spend their entire life doing that and they die in that state, they pass over in the spirit world, usually in the hells, because any person who's, who's had a purposeful ignorance has already broken a number of laws that they are not aware of. And then, as I said uh, previously in, this, in, this, in these sessions, it's very, very hard to motivate them to do something because they're so ingrained just doing nothing, really. Yeah? So very, very hard to motivate those, those kind of people. Okay, so the other alternative is to choose to sin more. Now, why would we do that? Well, because most of us believe that a sin is not a sin. That's the problem. We, we believe there's no, either no such thing as sin 
or that a sin is not a sin. We think sin is a good thing. So, so when I say we think th- sin is a good thing, think of like your addictions. Most of us believe that meeting our addictions is a good thing. And there's an example of sinning and thinking it's a good thing. Right? So, so most, of, most of humanity, unfortunately at this stage, chooses to sin more. And the world, I don't know if you've noticed this, but the world, if you compare the world now with the world 100 years ago, it is much easier to sin more now than it used to be 100 years ago. There was a a momentum in the world 100 years ago uh, of some semblance of what you would classify as moral righteousness. In other words, uh, there was the society viewpoint generally though of, a cer- of certain things being morally right. Morals nowadays are looked upon as like a- an old Christian concept that needs to be thrown away, right? And the problem with that is that very few people have any internal morals or, or develop internal morals. And as a result of that, there's an automatic result, which is sinning more because they feel there's no such thing as sin at all. Right, so that, that's an issue. So the result of sinning more is not only does the original sin that you had remain, right? So that still is there, isn't it? The original stuff that was still there is still there. But, uh, but now that you're breaking more laws, you've got a build-up of more sin. Right. Now, remember, we said yesterday that sin is the res- is causing pain and and in the long term suffering. So this is me- this means basically that you have a build up of extra pain and you have more suffering. Well, it sounds really attractive, doesn't it? If you do that, but isn't it interesting because we we because we don't marry up the cause and effect. We don't join together the cause and effect. So, so when we get into more pain, we don't say, oh, well, that's because I sin more. Can you see that? We blame it on other things. We go, oh, I got sick, my, you know, uh, or I had an accident or you know, I had this particular event happen and I got a disease and I got a sickness and whatever it was, and that's why I'm in more pain. And I'm talking now about physical pain. And, and we don't say, oh, no, hang on a sec, this particular event this pain that I'm in has a cause that I need to discover. And, and so what we do is we ignore another law. There's a law called the law of cause and effect, and we ignore it. What we try to do is we try to break the chain between the cause and effect. So what we say is, oh, I've got this effect, which is my pain, but, but it doesn't have a cause that has anything to do with me. <coughs> right? And this is what causes us to continue to sin more because we, we're not seeing the relationship between cause and effect. All right. So this is why, again, we need to learn about that law, the law of cause and effect. We need to f- always find the real cause of something rather than treating what we believe the cause to be. Does that make sense? Kathleen, you want to ask? Is our children's pain coming from us? Like if they catch the flu from somebody at school or... Yep. So our our children's pain is a reflection back at us. So this is a cause and effect issue. We need to examine the cause inside of ourselves as to what's going on there. And a lot of these sicknesses, physical, we are more sensitive to because they cause us the instant pain, don't they? And so we're more sensitive to. But the reality is even the bigger issues are the emotional pain. Because they cause us long-term problems. Many long-term problems in our lives are caused by holding on to past emotional pain. And the problem with holding on to past emotional pain is we make different decisions with it that we would have made than we would have made if we had n- no pain inside of us at all. So we finish up making choices based on the pain or choices of fear of pain, choices preventing pain that actually cause more pain. And, and so the problem is, is that we need to understand law, but, but the majority of people on the planet have no desire to understand law. 
And this is a part of our education in love. To, to be educated in love, we need to understand law. Law is a very important part. Now, the majority of people on this planet uh, want to rebel against law. So they do that against human law, but they mostly do it against God's laws. And we've got to, if we're going to use our will positively, we'd want to correct that desire, wouldn't we? If we're ever going to love, we'll need to correct that desire. So sinning more, um, we see that as an option because we don't believe we're sinning. That's why we see it as an option. So if you said to the majority person or majority of persons, do you realise that's a sin and describe the reason why, the majority of persons would probably sit down and try to analyse that a bit. But, but the reality is, before we even begin, they don't want to do that. right? When I mean, what I mean by that is most of us do not want to become personally aware of sin because the sin that we're engaging, we believe, is going to benefit us. So we don't want to become personally aware of sin. Like, why does a person go out to steal? Because they believe that the action is going to benefit them, right? Why does a person cheat, um, cheat on their partner? Same reason, isn't it? They think the action is going to benefit them somehow. There's a short-term benefit from the action, in their opinion. And this is the thing, is, is we commonly believe that Th that there is either no such thing as sin or if there is that it's not the thing we're doing it's what other people have done <laughs> to us you know not what we've been doing so really what i'm doing there again is i'm choosing to break law isn't it and here i'm referring to god's laws Right. I'm choosing to break law more <laughs> than I currently have. Now, now, as we discussed yesterday, if I truly appreciated the relationship between sin and pain, right, then I would not do that probably, right? Would I? Like no person in their right mind would choose to have more pain. That's what we would assume. But the, the problem is because we have completely disconnected the cause from the effect, so effect, the effect being pain and the cause being my choice to sin, because we've disconnected this, these two facts from each other, we then believe our pain has another cause other than our sin. And I'm talking our sin personally and also collectively. Right? Okay, Jennifer, you want to... Do you think that um, many of us have numbed out in regards to how we see sin because of religion? Of course. Because I think I got that. Yeah. Yes, because the word sin for most of you connotates a judgment, does it not? Yeah. Judgment. Right. And remember, we've talked about judgment. judgment. Judgment is a very negative thing to do about yourself here. Now, I'm using sin in the context of your, uh, 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 the, the action or word or thought that is just out of harmony with God's love and truth. That's all it is. I'm not judging that you have it because I have it too. How can I do that? Like That would be so hypocritical, right? So what we need to do is we need to remove the judgment but still see the problem. So this was a big thing in the first century for me. You know, quite frequently I'd start talking to, there, there was more sensitivity to the concept of sin then, and, and I'd start talking to groups about it, but they would still respond quite angrily because they felt they were being judged in that moment. Right? And this was a major problem quite, quite frequently. Um, uh, my life was threatened as a result. There was one time where my family saved me from getting thrown off a cliff, actually, because the group thought I was judging them. And the whole group, you know, once a mob mentality occurs, then you're in a lot of strife, generally. And, uh, and they just decided they were going to throw me off the, <laughs> off the cliff um, to get rid of me. And, and, and it was my family saying to them that I was crazy that actually got, <laughs> got me out of it. But, uh, 
But at the end of the day, it's sad that the majority of people, when they hear some truth, automatically believe they're being judged. Now, we talked about that this week, haven't we? The connection between your worth and your resistance to truth is a problem that needs to be broken because we need to see it as no this is just mud or dirt or what we would classify as the sin that's entered us it's just mud or dirt that needs to be washed off us and the only way it's going to be washed off is with the waters of truth right that's the only way it's going to come off so we need to start seeing the beauty of truth and the benefit to our life rather than opposing it because we believe our worth is getting attacked when we hear some truth. The reality is the majority of us when we hear truth don't believe it's true. Isn't it? Isn't that true? There's <laughs> too many truths there. <laughs> The majority of us, when we hear somebody, when somebody says a truth to us, the majority of us do not believe that is true. It's interesting, though, that majority of us do believe the truth. It is true when somebody says some truth to somebody else that we agree with. Right? Then it's just we've been afraid to say it to them, and generally we agree with them under those circumstances. But when it's at us, we generally don't see that. And this is a problem because this is our resistance to the concept of sin. Now, the concept of sin is not a judgment. It's just a, it's just a concept that I started talking about. And the reason why I used it in the first century was because it was used before my time in the first century as a concept, a breaking of God's laws. The big problem was that the majority of people thought they were breaking God's laws when they weren't, and a lot of people thought they weren't breaking God's laws when they were. So, so the, the concept of sin had to be adjusted uh, so that it was more in harmony with God's truth. But the concept of sin is a very important concept to retain, I feel, within oneself, so that you at least know sin, sin is a short word, three-letter word, for out of harmony with God's love and truth. Now, it's a lot easier for me to say sin <laughs> than it is to say out of harmony with God's love and truth every time. You follow? And it's going to be a lot easier for you to see what's going on as well if you allow yourself to understand the concept. But I agree, there's a lot of Christian people from the past who've been judged through this process, and that's when it becomes harmful. As soon as you start judging another person for their sin, then there's a big issue, isn't there? Because then you'll take actions that are out of harmony with love towards that person. And it's used against us as well. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's used to attack you. It's yeah, used to denigrate attack. you, to pull you down. That's not the way that I'm using it here. What I'm trying to do is just it, it, just call it what it is. It's out of harmony with God's love and truth, so therefore it's a sin. Stop judging it and just start seeing the truth of that statement. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, Barbara. Until I started replacing the word sin for um, um, oh, that was unloving, I took no notice of it. Correct. That's the problem. I've, so I've used the term that's unloving all the time I've been teaching you. For, like Formerly I've been probably teaching you for what, eight years on the average now. And I think it's about eight years ago or maybe even nine now. Um, and all that time I've been using, I've been using the word it's unloving and nobody takes any notice of that either and the reason why that is is because we believe we're loving that's why we have we have the world's definition of love right so we believe we're loving so when i use the word unloving to you that means oh somebody not meeting my addictions that's unloving somebody you know hurting me by telling me the truth that's unloving you know the, your our our definition of love is so skewed that actually at this stage for the majority of us our definition of love from God's perspective actually is sin. <laughs> In other words, from God's perspective, your definition of love at this stage often is completely unloving from God's perspective. So actually our, the common definition of love on this planet is from God's perspective actually sin. So this is our problem. So I use the term love and you think you're already being loving. And I use the term sin and you already think you're sinless because you're already being loving. 
And then you've got the negative connotations associated with past history about the word sin, which involves judgment, so you reject the whole concept of sin, but you also still retain the concept that you're loving when you're not. Right? And what we've got to do is come to see the truth about where we're at, don't we? It's like that's an essential part of your growth. And what we're trying to do this week is to help you see the truth about your will. Where is it at? Is it, is it strongly motivated to, to love or, and to desire change, to love? Or is it actually not very well developed at all? Easily manipulated, easily controlled, easily pushed around, easily um, blackmailed or bribed? What, what, what is your will? Which one is it? And for the majority of us, we are easily pushed around when it comes to the use of our will. Right? Okay, so this problem with, with our, our version of love actually being sin from God's perspective means that we think we're being more loving when actually, from God's perspective, we're sinning more. So this is a big problem. This is why our definition of love has to change. But the only problem is we're not going to get a new definition of love unless we're open to the source of that definition. God, and there's a number of things we have to do to get open to the source of that definition that we have to change to, to, so that we can receive some of that love and therefore have a new definition of love. So the majority of us are locked up in the world's definition of love, not realising that everything we look at, we view it through those glasses of the world's definition. And as a result, we believe we're not sinning and then we're questioning why we're in so much pain. It's not fair. And then what we even go is we go one step further and say it must be God's fault we're in all this pain because we're doing the right thing. <laughs> so there must be, or, or there must be no God at all, which is where a, a large number of people are really ending up, isn't it? Right, where they believe there's no God at all. Or they be, they're com completely confused about God. They go, oh, why does God take my sister, mother, daughter, son, father? Why did God do that? I don't understand. Why did God put them through so much pain? Why did, you know, and this is because we actually, our version of love, we practice it, and then a lot of pain results because it's out of harmony with God's version of love. And then we question God as if God's the cause of that rather than seeing that we ourselves are, uh, and our definition of love is all is the problem. It's way out of harmony with God's. Right? So these are, these are issues that we face in terms of our definitions that we need to adjust. And you can't adjust it without you having some time to think about it, to work your way through it, to, and to measure the relationship between pain and sin. You need to put that relationship back together. Every time I'm in pain, there's a sin here. I need to make sure I understand that causal, cause and effect relationship between pain and the cause being sin. I need to see the relationship between these two things. Right? Aren't they isn't it interesting how they're very small words too? Sin, three letter word, pain, four letter word. Isn't it like it's so simple when you think about it? Even a little child could probably spell most of those words. Sin is going to cause pain. Right. So we need to establish that. So when we're in pain, it's an indication, and, and uh, many of us have even did, tried to desensitise ourselves from a pain, but, but over time that's pretty hard. Over longer periods of time, eventually the pain builds up to such a point that, that the majority of us go, yeah, I have to admit I am <laughs> in pain. Right. And then we have to see the relationship, and the relationship is that sin causes it. Right. So this is very important to understand. Rita, just down the front here. <clears throat> so if one has no pain, that means, also if one sins and has no pain, that means one is further from the truth because one is denied, denying the pain and in so much facade and has buried attached and whatnot. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, 
So, you know, if they're sinning and you feel there's no pain, and, and there never is because... And here we're talking about the fact that the reality is, from God's perspective, that if you are not tuning into your pain here on earth, you're going to have an intensive amount of it in your spirit state. Yeah. Right. That's why a lot of spirits have a lot of difficulty well, after they've first passed because there's a whole heap of pain that they you know, weren't allowing themselves to be conscious of when, before they passed, which is sad. It's far better to be sensitive to it. Helen? Um, the pain that's in me from what my parents did when I was young, mm -hmm. if I don't feel that and release that, is that still a sin? Yeah, of course. Right. Because the pain, while you're holding on to it, is causing you to take actions that would be out of harmony with love. So just stopping the action that's causing more pain from what your parents did yep. doesn't release the sin that the parents did. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So th we get to the third issue now, don't we, really? So let's raise the third issue, which is our best choice, if we're being logical, and that is to choose to release sin, isn't it? In other words, choose to love. <laughs> right? And we can put in brackets there, which is going to involve the rele release of sin and sinning no more, isn't it? Now, choosing love means also choosing love of oneself. So holding on to a painful emotion and not releasing it, releasing it is not a choice to love oneself. So, so you can see that's not being loving to oneself. It's also not being loving to the people around you because that pain influences your choices and decisions. It, it, it influences what you choose to do with the world around you. So, so it's highly likely you'll act in your pain under those circumstances with people around you, which means that they then have pain too as a result of you choosing to hold on to yours. So that's not very fair either, is it? You're, we're influencing other people by choosing to hold on to our personal pain, so we're not loving others as well. And we're certainly incapable of loving God because if, while this pain is within us, it's highly likely that we will not feel our emotion. And remember, feeling our emotion is essential if we're going to get a connection with God going. And the connection with God is essential if we want to be educated in love. So we're never going to be educated in love while we hold on to our pain. So these are problems, right, that we face. So choosing to love or, or choosing to release sin and sin no more, right, which is the same thing, isn't it? Remember sin being anything out of harmony with love and out of harmony with truth. So, so basically when we release anything out of harmony with love and out of harmony with truth from within us and we choose to not engage new things that cause us to get out of harmony with love and out of harmony with truth, then obviously we're going to be choosing to love. That's using our will to love. Using my will to love. So that's what it involves. Using my will to love involves releasing sin and sinning no more. Very simple. Right. Now, why is that so important? Well, we've already discussed that we need to have a connection with the source of all truth and all love if we're ever going to grow in our capacity to change our definition of love. And, and if we keep sinning, that takes us further away from that source. Can you see that? The more sin we engage, the more things that we do out of harmony with love and truth, the more disconnected we come from God, the source of all love and truth. Because we're internally opposing that relationship by our actions and our thoughts and our, and our uh, emotions. Right. So this is why I used to say in the first century frequently, Go and sin no more. Does that make sense? 
The person who chooses to sin no more now has the ability to receive, uh, be closer to God and receive a, high, a better definition of love than they currently have. A person who continues to sin is not going to have that. A person who continues to sin is obviously also going to have more pain and suffering. So encouraging a person to sin no more also encourages them to have less pain and suffering and more pleasure and happiness. Right. So quite a few of the statements that are in the Bible I actually did say and I said them for reasons that you can now understand. Right? Okay, so what happened to, in this process, what I need to do, I obviously need to awaken to the sin. And we've been talking about that a lot lately and we've talked about repentance. We've done presentations recently that you have been videoed about how to have an awakening to sin and the necessity of having an awakening to sin. And basically an awakening to sin is very simple. Before our viewpoint was this, right? basically that's our viewpoint we think when we sin that we're actually being loving or or we're getting loved but but the reality is that's not true right sin is and we start having an awakening to these particular concepts now we can awaken to the sin itself right and we can start to feel like, yes, this is definitely out of harmony with love. It's definitely out of harmony with truth. This is what is causing my pain. This is the effect my pain has been caused by this sin. And if I awaken to it, I have awareness of it and what's going on. Now I have the opportunity to remove it. So you could say we need to awaken to sin and then choose to remove it. Now that's why we're doing a whole series of presentations in the, in the talks, understanding God's laws, understanding sin, removing sin and engaging God's laws. Those four series of presentations we'll be doing in the assistance groups in the future are really revolving around this particular concept. Now before we present those particular concepts to you, we need to help you connect to the real state of where you are and that's why we're doing a whole section on developing my loving self before we cover those four subjects that I've just mentioned. And so our very next assistance group is going to be developing your loving self or developing my loving self so that we can become to have an awareness of where we're at. Because you can't change something that you're not aware needs to be changed. You need to become aware first. So we're going to go through that. And then we're focusing our attention on God's laws, understanding them, understanding in particular the ones that affect your soul and therefore affect your emotional welfare. You follow? And then we focus on uh, the sin itself, understanding sin, where it came from, what happened to it, what, what we do, how we engage it, all of these kind of things. And then we look at how to remove the sin using the laws we've come to understand. Does that make sense? So this is where, what we want to focus on. Now, what I'm suggesting to you, basically, from, from this entire week, you have these three choices. One of them is almost impossible to do. And I've never seen anybody in history actually do it for any extended period of time. And the other two are the real choices that are before you. It's, it's quite simple, isn't it? Uh, Yvonne, thanks. It took us 30 hours to get there. It it feels like a bit of a chicken and egg situation for me. Like mm -hmm. I've become aware I had I've had very little will to love, if not none, all my life. Yep. But if but I've re I've recognised that if I had more will to love, then I would be more inclined to be able to recognise the sin and want to release the sin. And if I had more will to love, I'd be more motivated to want to repent and so on. Yep, I understand why you feel it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. Okay. Yep. I don't know what the way uh, out in, in other words, you feel it's a bit cyclic. Yes. Like, where do I start first? Yes. Is the, is the question really, isn't it? Yes. So where do I start first? 
Well, can you see now the importance of the talk that Mary gave two years ago regarding developing your will? Because there needs to be your primary first, the first choice needs to be to begin to develop your will to see sin and become aware of it, to develop your will to understand the difference between love and sin, to develop your will to see the cause and effect relationship between sin and pain so that you choose to have pleasure rather than pain. And you need to understand these particular principles and that to engage your, your to build your will muscle, Mary went through with you how to do that. She had two talks in that group. One was about just developing the will muscle itself and the other one was about developing the will muscle to develop a relationship with God. Right? And my suggestion to you is to go over those particular talks because there are very, very important information in there about how you shift from this seeming cyclical problem, which is, I don't have, I think sin is love, so therefore I'm probably, when I, whenever anybody talks about love, I'm probably going to choose my sin because I think that's loving. And, and th then, of course, uh, that causes our will to even be further suppressed uh, in a loving manner. And, and we end up in this spiral downwards under those circumstances. So how do we reverse that? Well, she has already gone through with you the information of how to reverse that. Right? But the majority of you didn't see the importance of it at the time. And in fact, if you analyse your behaviour over the last nearly two years since that time, you haven't probably done much of what she should, should see that she should <laughs> <laughs> she suggested in that particular discussion. Yeah, Glenn. I see now also why it's important to know where I am and um, self-reflection. Yeah, you, you need to know, you need to, it's like becoming aware of your own definition of love and then becoming aware and comparing that with God's definition of love and trying to see the difference is very, very important, isn't it? So because it, cause wherever it's different, there is a problem. There's going to be a problem because wherever it's different, you're going to be drawn into automatic sin. You will automatically engage at thinking that you're actually being loving when you're actually sinning. And that, that's going to be a problem because that's going to cause the, the, the build-up of more sin, the build-up of more pain and so forth. You want to stop that cycle. Right. Now let's go over some of the suggestions Mary made to you back then. For just briefly, so I'll rub out, let's assume that uh, after seeing that particular presentation now, you've decided that three option three is the best option, right? And I, I do feel that many of you may not decide that, but, but in the long run, you will have definite regrets in not deciding that. So let's say option three is our best option. So what do we do to build this will? Now Mary went through, like I said in 2014, what, what were the primary ways that you build a muscle? Can you remember what were the primary ways? Sh Sheridan, thanks. Uh, repetitive um, stimuli, like well, to try and build the muscle? Or well, yeah, the f the fir uh, you've said two of, two of them. The first one is you need some kind of overwhelming stimuli. Mm. In other words, the stimuli just can't be your normal court stimuli. You, it can't be the normal way of doing things because if it's your normal way of doing things, nothing will change. It has to be more than what you would engage normally. So it's like exercise. You know, you're not going to burn fat or build muscle if you just do exactly the same as you've been doing every single day for the last 20 years. You're going to have to do something that's different and more intense. Right? So, so it has to be overwhelming stimuli. You need some kind of thing. So this is where your choices come into evolve when it comes to developing your will to love. You're now going to have to place yourself in situations that are overwhelming so that you can see what's going on. And when I say overwhelming, I'm talking about emotionally overwhelming, 
They don't have to be physical situations even. They, could just, they need to be emotionally overwhelming. Most of us, what we do to, in, to engage comfort in our lives is we avoid every single situation that emotionally overwhelms us where possible. And what I'm suggesting here is we have to do the opposite of that. Put yourself in situations that really confront you. So, for example, the majority of you work in a job, right, that you're getting a weekly wage from, and most of you probably find that you're not doing what you want to do. It's not what your passion is. So you're going to have to start dealing with that somehow. So that might mean actually taking some out-of-job out of job, you know. Uh, education in the in the areas that you really are passionate about and start developing your passion along those particular lines right now that's going to be you're going to require that's going to require an effort from you it's going to stress you out a bit it's going to cause you to feel emotional about some things and it might make you think you're dumb and a lot of other things and you'll have to work your way through all that emotionally right so the, the overwhelming stimuli being the choice to place yourself in a situation where you're getting educated in the area where you want to be rather than just where you currently are right so that's just a single example in terms of changing your job so you might not leave your current job but you'll at least start triggering the overwhelming thing by actually engaging a plan for a new one and actually developing a plan and a strategy for you to reach that new one is going to cause certain emotions and certain feelings to come up naturally can you see just overwhelming stimuli is just a simple example then another thing sherry mentioned it is that it has to be repetitive In other words, you, you can't just do it once and hope that everything's going to change. Right? This is what I notice uh, nowadays is that most people believe that everything should be really simple and easy to get, don't we? Like we walk in a shop and, and if there's not 25 different types of cornflakes, um, then we're upset because it's not the one that we want is not there. Right? If it's not easy to get, we, we, we basically feel that, you know, oh, that's a terrible shop, not going there again, let's go somewhere else. And, and, and we see our life like that with everything. We want everything to be easily obtained. Relationship with love and truth is not going to be easily obtained. And the reason why is because the world has a completely opposite definition of it than God does. So if you really want to get God's definition of love and truth, you're going to have to go against the grain of the world to do it right so it's not going to be like going shopping and having everything on tap it's not going to be like that. It's going to require personal will strength of will to engage a process right? and it's going to have to be repetitive you need to um, also feed yourself well don't you and there we basically talked about Mary basically talked about with you um, for, so food and, and sustenance if we talk about sustenance from a uh, is it ANC or ENC so ANC um, <clears throat> if we if we sustain ourselves by just watching telly half the day and listening to the news and listening to all the fear-based stuff that chatter that goes on you know in our life and and looking at our facebook likes and dislikes and uh, and you know reading our emails and doing all of those kind of things which the average person and carries around their mobile phone is checking it all the time can't even have a conversation with a person and uh, without the phone interrupting somewhere and we do all of that what are we feeding ourselves with where well, we're feeding ourselves with gossip and innuendo <laughs> now is that going to develop a will to love no we need to choose that's what the world's doing it's cool to do that it's cool to be connected like that feeds your addictions and everything else but but is it real food no it's not it's, it's not going to be what you need to choose to feed your life on you're going to need to feed your life on things that upbuild you and change you and cause you to have modify your direction so that it's more in harmony with god's viewpoint of love and truth and and gossip and innuendo doesn't do that in fact, in fact, if gossip and innuendo just tears it all down, doesn't it? Right? And most of what you see in the media, most of what you see in the social networks, and most of what you see you know, in your inbox and in your emails is advertising gossip and innuendo. 
It's, it's not, most of it's not even a real interaction with anybody. So, so you know, you're not sustaining yourself there with, with development of real food. When you watch telly, sure, if you want to watch telly for a bit of entertainment, that's fine, but as long as it's just entertainment and it's not changing the, your will, because if it's changing your will, where do you think it's changing your will towards? It's the world's viewpoint of everything, the system we live in. Where is it going to be changing your will? It's going to be changing your will towards the world's viewpoint. Right? So it's one thing to look at it for information or look at it for some entertainment value, but quite another to then trust that it's real, which we have a tendency to do. Right? It's far better to go, I oh, don't know about that. And in the end, it's not real from God's perspective, even if it is real from the earth's perspective. It's not even real from God. So, so we need to educate ourselves, feed ourselves with different things than that. Right? And then we also talked about the life-giving water, because you know, building a muscle needs water, and water is everything. And here we liken that to truth, Mary did in her previous presentation with you. So, so here we go. We've got to now have a thirst for truth. A thirst for truth. We're, we're passionately desiring truth in our lives. Now, now, that was what was presented to you two years ago. That's how you change the exercise of your will. Right? But if we compare two years ago with now, most of us haven't changed since then very much. So that's an indication we did not apply that information. So we have a choice. Do you, you want to keep doing what you're doing or do you want to choose something differently? What do you want to do? Now, you can engage all of these things spiritually very easily or you can ignore them completely and then hope for change, which will, of course, be a vain hope because it won't happen. Right. Gary, thanks. Hey, Jay, with the overwhelming stimuli, mm -hmm. um, that, that could relate to any of the four aspects that, you know, Definitely. truth... You Definitely know, doesn't like technically mean just doing a physical change like your job. It could be like confronting a truth about yourself. Exactly. I was just giving you an example with the physical oh, change. Okay. Far better off emotional change, isn't it? So here we really want to do this in re aspect to all of those things that prevent us using our will. So lack of faith, develop my faith. Lack of desire for truth, so develop my desire for truth. How, how am I going to trigger that? That's real easy. Tell the truth to everybody today. So when someone comes up and you don't want to talk to them, say, I, I don't feel like talking to you, I'm sorry. Most of you don't do that even. You go, oh no, not that person again. <laughs> and, and then they say, why don't you want to talk to me? You go, oh, I just don't feel like it. Instead of saying, well, the reality is I just feel a barrage of rage coming from you and I don't like that, so I don't really want to talk to you. You don't tell them the truth. If you told them the truth every single moment, just try that one day. That would be overwhelming stimuli for the majority of you, right? <laughs> do the same with action. You, you plan some things to, to do that, uh, where you're going to act where you wouldn't normally act. You'd put off acting. You'd put off taking some, some kind of decision. And overwhelming stimuli to eventually get into and feel your emotion. These are very positive ways to use this in terms of your will so that you can break down your resistance to wanting to change and wanting to use your, use your will in a positive way. If you can break those things down emotionally, th then at the end of the day, you will start wanting to use your will in a positive way. It will be quite natural, actually. Yeah, so you could actually choose to use these principles with those particular things, which remember these were the resistances we had to developing our will to love. So, so let's focus on getting rid of them. That would be great, wouldn't it? That would be a great thing to do. Get rid of the resistances so that we're, we're not having any more resistance to actually engaging our will to love. That would be fantastic. But even if we're not there yet, we could go back even two days earlier and, and just say, OK, I'm going to face the facts about where I am with regard to love and where I am with regard to change. You could even do that. You focus some attention 
with those four things on that particular process of exposing to yourself your true feelings about change, your fears and so forth about it, and your true feelings about love and how your true feelings about God and so forth and allow yourself to start thinking about feeling them. Right? So there's, there's quite a lot you can do, right, to, to make these adjustments. And so, so while, Yvonne, you said earlier that you feel it's cyclical, I don't believe it has to be. It's only cyclical because, you know, like in a cycle, we're only in a cycle because we're choosing to not do these things. We're, we're choosing to remain where we are rather than break the cycle. And that is also a choice. That is something to do with our will. It was important to me what you said that we didn't realise the importance of this. Um, but also I realised that I've looked at those exercises but it's the repetitive. It's doing it over and over. And, um, and, and I think for me, like... The food, the sustenance, yes, I do immerse myself in divine truth. But I think it needs to be specifically to my will and sin and these four things here that we've talked about. Like, Can I comment about this immer so-called immersion in yeah. divine truth? Because a lot of people do this. They, they hear divine truth and then they just watch video after video and they're fascinated by it and all those kind of things. But we don't do anything about it. We just, we just want to hear it. So we need to get honest with ourselves about how afraid we are of doing it rather than just hearing it. You know, when you actually do it, you'll find that you'll probably slow down how many videos you watch and you'll look at one video and you go, right, next week, next month, that's going to be my focus. And you might watch that same video again in the next week and you might watch it the same again a week later and the same again a week later and then ask yourself the whole time, am I actually doing that? Is that has that been my focus? Like rather than sort of going through all this material, most of which is just going way over your head at this stage, right? Because because your definition of love is already like like I said to you before, how many talks have I done about the world's definition of love and you've never considered that maybe the world's definition of love is yours? And why do you think I gave the talks? Because, and see, it's yours. That's why it, it applies, right? That's why I gave those talks at that time. You follow? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so, so this is a problem that we have. We, we, we are constantly trying hard to actually avoid this change. And, and we're not being truly honest, are we, with ourselves about fear, our, you know, our lack of desire to love and those kind of things. So when Mary gave that talk, most of us ignored it back then, two years ago. And what I'm suggesting to you is go back to it and then reapply it to the stuff we've done this week in terms of developing your will to love and developing your will to change. Reapply that material. Does that make sense? Yeah. And use it in practical situations to change. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm already um, I'm already over uh, over time, and I've done half of this talk. So <laughs> that's a bit of a problem. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I wanted to focus you on what what using your will to love would mean, but but the reality is um, I. The main thing I wanted to say from this particular talk is choose option number three. <laughs> because you, you're guaranteed to have less pain, more pleasure, less suffering, more happiness. You also will actually start to use your will in a positive direction then. So choose option three. Um, of course, you don't have to do what I tell you to do, but... but my advice to you would be to choose option three and I'm hoping to inspire you to choose option three and I'm hoping to influence you to choose option three <laughs> somehow. <laughs> yeah. Now, 
in the outline Mary created here for this particular talk, you, you'll see a, a lot of the what using your will is going to mean. So I'm not going to have the time to go through those particular things, although we might be able to, in the, in the following Q&A, go through some of these things. But, but I feel it's very important for you to understand this underlying basic principle, and that is, unless I choose option three, more pain, more suffering will result. And unless I choose to change my definition of love, while I believe that love is, that, my, my, that the sinful things I'm choosing to do are love, while I believe that, I'm already not receiving God's definition of love and that's going to be a huge problem for my life. Okay. So what we're going to do now is have a 10 minute break and we'll have our last Q&A for, the, for, the ser for this series of sessions. So this is your opportunity to ask any question you need to about using your will. All right. Good day.